You've tuned in to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint of Calvary Chapel, Houston. Here's a preview from Pastor Ron of today's message. Jesus is the perfect example. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And he sat down at the right hand of God. He could do that. Why? He knew what was waiting for him. Glory. Glory. Our heavenly perspective in regards to salvation is so important. This is why Peter said in 1 Peter 1.13, gird up the loins of your mind. In other words, another way to say it would be put your helmet on. We humans can be extremely self-centered at times. It could be at work where we tend to envy our coworkers or in a relationship where we fail to recognize what our partner truly requires. But there is someone who did something that no one could ever imagine doing. Pastor Ron tells you in today's message how Jesus took all of our sin on the cross with him and washed us clean. Even though he despised sin, he considered reuniting us with the Father and bore all of the pain with joy set before him. Well, let's join Pastor Ron in the book of Ephesians chapter 6 with today's edition of Larger Than Life. When I realize I'm just a stranger, I'm just a pilgrim, I'm just a sojourner, that frees me up. I am freed up to fight the good fight of faith. I am freed up to live for Jesus, to be living in just absolute surrender so that he says, whatever, whatever he asks, wants me to do, I'm going to do it. It enables me to fight so readily. Why? Because I see the light at the end of the tunnel. Frankly, that's how I live, folks. I, if you're not seeing that, maybe you're not walking closely with Jesus because the more I walk with Jesus, I see the finish line. I see the finish line. It's not far away. Now, I'm hoping it's 30 or 40 years away. <laughs> but that's not that far away. Or it could be tomorrow. I'm ready for that too. I, I could see it. So however long he has me, it's so brief in comparison to eternity. But it enables me to really run for him. I really truly believe the reason why so many people in this life are in such despair is they have no hope. They have no hope. So many people are hopeless. The most shocking thing to me as a believer, as a believer, is when I see a believer who doesn't have hope. When I see a believer who is depressed, when I see a believer is down, I'm thinking, what, what's, what's going on? What's going on? Because it's been said that life without Jesus is a hopeless end. But life with Jesus is endless hope. It is. I've got joy now. But I, man, I've got such joy because I know what the future has in store for me. Listen to what Paul wrote when he wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He said, we're hard pressed on every side, but I'm not crushed. I am perplexed but I'm not in despair. I'm persecuted, but I'm not forsaken. I'm struck down, literally beaten. He's talking about physically, physically beaten down, but I'm not destroyed. And I don't lose heart. Are you kidding me? You know, there's a lot of people that lose heart right now. Maybe that's you. Maybe he's, I've lost heart. Well, let me point you to Paul. Are you like Paul? Have you been beaten down? Have you been persecuted? Have you been in despair? He says, but I'm not losing heart even though my outward man is perishing. Some people in our own church are really fighting physically through cancer, through great difficulty, yet they're trusting Jesus. What an example. And why could Paul say all this? He says, because I know my light affliction. He called all that a light affliction, really? That's a light affliction? He says, it's just for a moment. It's not gonna be that long. And it's working for us a far eternal, exceeding weight of glory. I can see the finish line. I can handle all this stuff here. Wow, that's so good. See, when we have a heavenly perspective, when you have that helmet of salvation on, man, you can cope with this life. I'll tell you, you can cope with this life. Paul spoke about this again in Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. And he said, for I reckon, which tells us Paul must have been from the south. He says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time aren't worthy. We shouldn't even be talking about it. Aren't worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Why do we even, we, we talk about all the problems, but we got glory. Stop whining. That's my translation. If I was to do a paraphrase, it says, stop whining, church. You got glory in the future. Press on for Jesus. It's a good word. Jesus is the perfect example. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And he sat down at the right hand of God. He could do that. Why? He knew what was waiting for him. Glory. Glory. Our heavenly perspective in regards to salvation is so important. 
This is why Peter said in 1 Peter 1.13, gird up the loins of your mind. In other words, another way to say it would be put your helmet on. Be sober and hope to the end. Have hope. You have hope in Christ. So we need to put the helmet of salvation on. Why? Well, number one, as we've been talking about, it gives us a proper perspective in this life, and it helps us because we know we're going to be in the future. But more importantly, in regard to our text, and now that's what I want to talk about, it becomes an impenetrable force of protection against the lies of the enemy. So we've talked about this helmet, this helmet of salvation. Let's then talking about, let's talk about these attacks. Let's talk about these hindrances. In light of the fact that we're in a spiritual warfare, Paul tells us to put this helmet on. Stand in the confidence that the hope of your salvation brings. Why? Because Satan wants to rob you of your hope. He can't take away your salvation, but he can discourage you and take away the hope of your salvation. If God wants us to live in the confidence of who we are in Christ and what we have waiting for us, don't you know that's exactly where Satan's going to attack you? God wants to, says, seek your, have your mind on things above. Seek those things which are beyond. So the devil wants to do, he doesn't want you to think about glory. He doesn't want you to have that great perspective. He wants you to think about now. Don't ever look up. Don't look up. Don't think up. Just think about now. How depressing. How discouraging. That's exactly what he wants to do to the believer. That's his broadsword that he seeks to hit you in the head with. There's a story told about the devil who at one time was advertising his tools for sale. And there was an auction. And there were prospective buyers who came. And there was one oddly shaped tool, though, that was labeled not for sale. So one of the men asked the devil, why is this not for sale? Well, Satan said, all the other ones are for sale, but I actually can't. I can't give up that one tool. It is my most useful weapon that I have. It is discouragement. With it, I could work its, my way into the hearts of men otherwise inaccessible. And when I use this tool in a person's heart, then the way is open to plant anything else in its place. We as believers need to have our helmet of salvation on because Satan wants to attack us with discouragement. He wants to steal our hope, get us focused just on the here and now. That's the way he works. That's his tactic. And here's the thing. We need to be on our guard always. Now, I could just say that statement and just move on, but I really want to spend a good amount of time highlighting that. We need to be on our guard for his discouragement always. For example, number one, we need to be on our guard for discouragement when we experience success or a spiritual high. You'd think that's when you least need to be worried about discouragement, when you're actually doing well. But you know what? That's when the devil likes to come in. He's always on the prowl. I think a classic example of this is Elijah, the prophet Elijah. We, we read about a story in 1 Kings chapter 18. Elijah was greatly used by God. In fact, God was using him to turn the hearts of the people away from idol worship back to the true and living God. And, and in that story in that chapter, God uses him in really one of the greatest showdowns in the history of the world. He, he challenges the, the prophets of Baal. Okay, let's, let's meet on Mar Carmel. Let's have a showdown. Your God is the God of fire and lightning. Baal, great. Make a sacrifice. I'll do the same. And, and you pray to your God. And if he brings down fire from heaven and consumes the, the altar, he's the true and living God. If he consumes mine, Jehovah is the true and living God. And there they away. They go all day long, all morning long, all afternoon. And, and Elijah begins to taunt him. I love it. I think it's fantastic. He says, hey, what, what's going on? Your, your God must be sleeping. Maybe he's on vacation, right? I love it. He's just prodding them. And then they begin to cut on themselves, bleeding while they're marching around their, their, their altar. Oh, Baal, you know. Finally, it's Elijah's turn. Pretty simply, he, he says, look, I just want to make sure you know that without a doubt he's true God. So he gets a pail of water and drops it on it, not once, not twice, but three times, then prays, Lord, if you are the true God of heaven, please bring fire down from heaven. And God not only consumes the sacrifice, but the wood, the stones, and the dust, and all the water. And what does Elijah do? He has all those guys put to death. He has them all put to death. Now, let me tell you something. As far as being a spiritual high, that was it. I mean, that was it, right? I mean, he must have thought about this all the time. He, he's excited. Look what God has done. We're turning the nation back to God. 
But then as soon as that happens, Jezebel hears about what Elijah had done, and she puts an all-points bulletin for the guy for his life. She says in 1 Kings 19, 2, may the gods deal with me and more so if by this time tomorrow I don't make your life, Elijah, like those dead prophets. And you know what happened? Here's this man that would stood 450 prophets and at the word of this one gal, he takes off running. He finds himself discouraged. In fact, he becomes so discouraged, he's suicidal. In that same chapter, chapter 19, he says, it's God, I can't take it, take my life, I don't want it anymore, God, I can't handle it. I mean, that's how he is. I've met people like that. They're just falling apart. Why? Why, dear believer, are you falling apart? David said the same thing he wrote in the Psalms. Why are you cast down, my soul? Hope in God. Hope in God. If you're discouraged tonight, you go, I can't take Why? You have lost your heavenly perspective. Hope in God. But Elijah did. He became suicidal. And in his discouragement, he actually fell asleep. An angel wakes him up. He says, look, take some food. And he actually smoked some food there. A little Texas smoker right there. Maybe some brisket. Dude, wake up, eat this. And then he stays there another 40 days. And he's even more discouraged. And he says, Jezebel's going to kill me, you know. And he goes, uh, you know, it's just, he's having a pity party. He continues to have his little pity party. And he says, I'm the only one. No one understands, you know. And God says, basically, God says, shut up, Elijah. There are 7,000 other men who have not bowed the knee, and they're serving me. Knock it off. Now, we can go on with the rest of the story, but the point is this. You can be on a spiritual high. I'm doing great. But listen, if you don't have the helmet of salvation continuing on, you can find yourself discouraged, always on our guard. Secondly, we need to be on our guard when we're in unbroken service. And I know this is going to minister to a good portion of you here for sure. Because you could be serving the Lord. God calls us to serve. We should all be serving. And you're doing that, and it's wonderful. But the fact is, it's hard work. And Satan will come to you when you're tirelessly serving Jesus and say, really, you need to take a break. After all, I don't really think anybody really appreciates what you're doing. You've been serving a long time. Take a break. After all, do you really think you're making much of a difference anyway? Kind of looks like you're just kind of spinning your wheels, you know. And when you're serving the Lord tireless, tirelessly, working him hard for him because you love him, and you don't have your helmet on, you can easily give in to that. Yeah, you know, you're right. People don't appreciate me. Yeah, you're right, I am looking hard, working hard. Yeah, I don't know if I'm really making that much of a difference, you know. That's why Paul, when he wrote to the Galatians in chapter 6 and verse 9, he says, let us not grow weary in well-doing. So that's a word to those of you who are serving. Don't go weary in well-doing, for in due time you will reap if you faint not. And by the way, in due time, we always think, well, when is that going to be? Is that next week? Is that next month, next year? It might be, it may not even be here on this earth. It may be in heaven. That's how I read that passage, to be honest with you. Because the more I serve the Lord, I don't, I don't see myself getting more rest. It actually gets more intense. I think the rest is heaven. That's retirement, folks. That's retirement. Retirement is heaven. I know, I was, so I'm just thinking, if there's any of you here getting near retirement, don't let me know, because I know I'm going to grab you. Serve the Lord. Retirement is heaven. But here's the thing, you could be serving the Lord and get discouraged, get very discouraged. And I've seen it happen. Just, man, I, I'm just tired of doing this. And, no one, and, it, and Satan uses that to discourage you. Wait a second, have the hope of salvation, your helmet on. It's all about Jesus, here I go. Let me also say this. Some of you here tonight perhaps are not serving the Lord. And maybe one of the reasons, well, frankly, one of the reasons why your brother or sister are getting discouraged and burnout is because you're not helping. We're all to be serving, you see. Hits all of us. But we need to be on our guard when we're serving the Lord. Number three, we need to be on our guard against Satan's discouragement when we see other people go down in the battle. It's easy for us to get discouraged because we had our eyes on them. We don't have our helmet of salvation. It's all about Jesus. We have our eyes on them and we can become discouraged. We always need to be reminded that men are limited. They, they are flawed, Right? So we need to keep our eyes on Jesus, Hebrews 12 says. He's the author. He's the finisher of our faith, right? But it is easy to get discouraged when we see that happen. So our eyes are on the Lord. 
and we pray for one another, and we encourage one another. But we need to be on our guard because that does happen in the body of Christ, doesn't it? And I'm not just talking about pastors or people we know, but just anybody we know in the church who we know and love. It's discouraging. Fourthly, we need to be on our guard against Satan's broad sort of discouragement in times of heavenly chastening. Because the Bible tells us in Hebrews 12, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Just as we do that as earthly fathers to our children, so God loves us and he does it to us. But it's in times like that when God is chastening us, we need to make sure that we have that helmet of salvation on. Because if we don't, as soon as God chastens us, here comes Satan. God doesn't love you. He doesn't care about you. Oh, really? Then why is he doing that to you? Why is he chasing? Why is he disciplining, you see? Why is God treating you that way? You don't have that helmet on, you start joining in with God. Yeah, that's right. Start joining in with some of your unbelieving friends that are saying the same thing. But you know what the writer to the Hebrews said in that very passage? Now, no ch chastening ever seems joyful for the moment, but painful. Of course it does. That's what it's all about, to discipline us. But afterwards, it does yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. We always want to be trained by God's chastening. But again, we have to be on our guard. Number five, I would say we need to be on our guard against Satan's discouragement, especially in times of adversity. He wants to bring you down. He wants to discourage you. And so he tries to take away the hope you ever hear of salvation. You lose a loved one. You lose someone in your family, a spouse, a child, a father. I mean, we, we lose loved ones all the time. That's part of life. I know I was talking to a gal in the, in the foyer on Sunday, a young gal, and she's having such a hard time because I lost my, my daddy not too long ago. And, I'm, and I, so I, I said, I understand that. I understand that, that human emotion, that part. I know. But let me, let me get your, let me, let's talk about where he is. He's a believer. Yeah, he's with Jesus. Now let's talk about what you're dealing with and, and, and how you can have your eyes on the Lord and how you can be encouraged. Don't, don't be discouraged. Get your perspective right, you see. But maybe you've lost a loved one or maybe you've lost a job. It could be the constant adversity you experience, maybe being married to an unbelieving spouse. Or maybe it's the unfulfilled promises of a friend, persecution at work. There are all kinds of ways that adversity comes in this life. By the way, they seem to come in waves, I found. Boom, 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 boom. And, you know, just like it happened with Job, so it happens with us, right? And there is Satan. He's trying to discourage us, to look at the situation as seemingly hopeless. It's hopeless. It's never hopeless. Again, we tend to look at things like easy, difficult, impossible, right? Situation comes up, oh, easy. Easy. Oh, that's going to be tough. We can get through this. We can get through this. one. Forget about it, right? And we forget, wait a second, where's God in this whole equation? Nothing's impossible with God. But if you don't have the helmet of salvation and you don't have that perspective right, you're looking at everything through the eyes of men. Oh, I love Job. Because Job, in one single day, loses his children, loses employees, loses all of his you know, flocks. Everything he has, he loses it all. And it tells us he worshiped the Lord. And by the way, I know he had his helmet on, the helmet of salvation, because he says in Job 19, 25, I know my Redeemer lives. And after this skin is destroyed, after I die in my flesh, I'm going to see God. I'm going to be in glory. He had his perspective right. That's why he could do it. So we need to watch out for the broad sort of discouragement in times of spiritual success, in times of unbroken service to the Lord, when others fall, right? In times of chastening, in times of adversity. What protects our thoughts from the lies of Satan? It's our salvation. I love the hymn writer who wrote this. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. The strife will not be long. This day, the noise of battle. The next, the victor song. This life is short. To him that overcrown, uh, overcomes a crown of life shall be. He, the king of glory, shall reign eternally. Perspective. Now, let me take one more turn and, and talk about one other thing in regard to the helmet of salvation. Generally speaking, when you think about a helmet, it is defensive, right? A helmet is something defensive. It keeps you, protects you defensively from the blows uh, of a sword and so forth. But I think spiritually speaking, we can also, when we're putting on the helm of salvation, do something proactive or offensively. 
Again, 1 Peter 1.13, Peter tells us to gird up the loins of our mind. You, you could say to put your helmet on. But that term gird up, and we saw it when we talked about the, the soldier's belt, it means to cinch up or pull together. What Peter is saying in that passage is pull your thoughts together. Don't let your guard be down. Keep your thoughts together for Christ. And I have found that if I will do that in a proactive way, it protects me. It protects me from the lies of the enemy. Great passage, classic passage, is Philippians 4 and verse 8. Paul says, finally, he's wrapping up his thoughts. And he says, finally, listen, church, if you're going to do one thing, this is what you need to be doing. And it has all to do with our thought life. He says, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things speak of a good report, not gossip, a good report, Whatever things are virtuous, not impure thoughts. Whatever things are virtuous. Whatever things are praiseworthy. That's awesome. That's wonderful. He says, meditate or give your mind to those things. So instead of my mind getting involved in all the yuck in this life, and by the way, that even happens amongst God's people. God forbid, and it does though. Instead of giving our thought life to that, these are the things that we give our minds to. That's putting on the helmet of salvation. I'm going to be proactive with my thoughts. I'm not going to entertain these other thoughts. And that protects me against the lies, the lies of the enemy. Paul said in Romans 12 and verse 2, don't be conformed to this world. It's so easy to be conformed to this world, isn't it? Especially in our day and age. I tell you, the more when I get outside of the United States and I'm doing missionary work, which again, I was just there, I was out of the country last week, more and more I love to get out of the country. And the more when I come back and I just and am entrenched, not just in our church, but in the church of Jesus Christ in general in the United States, we are so weak. We are so weak. We are so carnal. We are so caught up in the things of this world. We, we, need to, we need more of Jesus, let me tell you. Because people, when you go to another country, they have nothing. Jesus is everything. Jesus is everything. So Paul says in Romans 12 and verse 2, don't be conformed to this world. It's easy to happen. But be transformed here, how he says, by the renewing of your mind. Put your helmet on that you may prove or that, what, that you may know what is the good and acceptable, perfect will of God. I want God's will. I want to be able to relinquish evil thoughts. I want to distinguish what is right and wrong. How do I do that? I'm renewing my mind. I'm putting the helmet of salvation on on a regular basis. In fact, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, he reminds us, and again, the same context. He says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. So we're not fighting a physical battle, but a spiritual battle. He says, they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds casting down arguments and every high thing, evil thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Helmet of salvation. Paul wasn't just saying this on his own. Hey, it's kind of a cool thing. Look at that helmet. We got to put something on like that. No, this was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And we could put on a helmet of salvation. We've been given salvation that encompasses our past, our present, and certainly our future. And so defensively, it can avert all of the attacks of discouragement because I'm safe and sound and I've got my right focus in regard to my salvation in Christ. And I can use it offensively. I'm regularly thinking about those things, choosing to think things that are biblical, and I'm rejecting those things that are earthly on a regular basis, being very proactive. Let me close with the words of Stephen Charnock. He said, uh, As the image on the seal is stamped upon the wax, so the thoughts of the heart are printed upon our actions. So our actions need to be those that take up the armor of God, put on the helmet of salvation, and we fight the good fight of faith. Amen. Do you ever wonder why you're here on earth? It might sometimes feel as if it's all too depressing and hopeless, but within the family of God, you'll find purpose that you never even dreamed of. You've been listening to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint. Pastor Ron is making his way through the book of Ephesians where you'll find so much purpose, you'll be bursting with it. Here's just one example found in Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
Not only do you have a purpose here on earth, but God also has gotten those good works ready for you ahead of time. He's just waiting for you to say yes and step in. And there's no better place to say yes than in a community of believers. Larger Than Life is a ministry of Pastor Ron Hint and Calvary Houston. Are you in the Houston area? We'd love to see you here next time you get a chance. We meet every Sunday at 9 and 11 in the morning and on Wednesday evenings at 7. You can find our location and answers to all your questions at ltlradio.org. Once again, that's ltlradio.org. If you can't make it in person, we highly recommend downloading our mobile app, which you can find on our website, or you can listen to Larger Than Life podcast to stay connected. And with that, join us next time on Larger Than Life.